from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Oh, that's much better. I'm Mark Demunation. I'm chief of the Rare Book and Special Collections Division. Uh, you're in the Lesson J. Rosenwald room, which is part of the division. Welcome to yet another talk on book arts here. We're uh, lucky today that we're co-hosting with the African and Middle Eastern Division, our neighbors down the hall. I'm going to introduce uh, Peggy Perlstein, who's head of the Hebraic section. And she's going to uh, talk to you a little bit about, uh, or introduce at least, Lynn Evidenka. Those of you who've had a chance to see the magnificent exhibition, <clears throat> uh, Words Like Sapphires, uh, will know that one of Lynn's books is in that exhibition, which is what prompted this to begin with. Uh, Anne Brenner and Peggy Prosty were very nice to take a couple of us through the exhibit, and we stopped at this tremendous uh, work and had a conversation. The next thing we know, we're lucky enough to have the book artist here. So this is Peggy Prosty. She'll give you a little bit of a uh, introduction, and then we'll um, hear from Lynn. Well, Mark has a booming voice, so he doesn't need the microphone. Uh, I hope that you can hear me all. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to today's program of the making of many books, a talk by book artist Lynn Avidenka, and she will be talking about the books in the display here that we have in our collection at the Library of Congress, very artfully arranged uh, with a book list and uh, lovely uh, captions uh, created by Ann Brenner and arranged uh, by Dan DeSimone. Dan is the curator of the Rosenwald Collection here in the Rare Books and Special Collections Division, and Dr. Ann Brenner is our area specialist in the Hebraic section. I think I've known Lynn for most of the 30 years that I've worked in the Hebraic section here at the library. I eagerly look forward to each new work she's created, the Hebrew text, which often engages her imagination, and then the expression of that text through design, calligraphy, images, and the ingenious physical construction of the object that contains her art. Today, many of the works are on display in this room, and as Mark mentioned, one other plum-colored regret is in the exhibit, Words Like Sapphires, A Hundred Years of Hebraic at the Library of Congress, 1912 to 2012, that's in the Southwest Gallery here in the Jefferson Building, and I hope you'll see it after the program. Lynn holds a BA and an MFA in Fine Arts from Wayne State University. She's received numerous grants and awards, including being honored in 2011 as one of four inaugural fellows of the American Academy in Jerusalem, and currently a visiting fellow at the Institute for Humanities at the University of Michigan. Lynn has held many solo exhibitions. Currently, her work is on display in Subject and Object, the Museum of Biblical Art in New York, and in Metamorphosis and Flux at the H Project space in Bangkok, Thailand. Were you there at the opening? <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, from the Bibliotheca Rosenthaliana in Amsterdam, to the British Library, to Houghton Library, Harvard College, to the Israel Museum, to Yale University, and beyond, Lynn's work is held in the permanent collections of many distinguished institutions. This event is being videotaped for subsequent broadcast on the library's website and other media. The audience is encouraged to offer comments and raise questions during the formal question and answer period, but please be advised that your voice and image may be recorded and later broadcast as part of this event. By participating in the question and answer period, you're consenting to the library's possible reproduction and transmission of your remarks. And now, Lynn Avidenka. Thank you to Peggy Perlstein, head of the Hebraic Division, and Mark Demunation, head of Rare Books and Special Collections, for the invitation to speak today. 
I'm honored to be here. And thank you to Dan and Anne for the beautiful display. My work is here because of Lila Averin. Lila was a scholar of the history of the book, calligraphy and book arts, who split her teaching time between the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor and Hebrew University in Jerusalem. It was Lila who introduced my work to Michael Grunberger, former head of the Hebraic division, who first acquired it for the library. Lila was a great supporter of my work, and I wanted to mention that today. My plan uh, today is to first offer some uh, remarks in a formal manner, and then speak less formally about the work that you see displayed over there, along with some other examples that I brought to share with you. So to begin, a clever girl from Victorian England, a French poet writing in the mid-1880s, an artist revolutionary from the Stalin era, era Soviet Union, a contemporary Scottish writer with an international reach, and finally, a cranky biblical philosopher. What do each one of them have to do with me and the books I make? Let's begin with the cranky jaded philosopher of the book of Ecclesiastes. His words provide the title of my talk, of the making of many books. Some of you may know the full passage, however, which is, beware, of the making of many books there is no end. And it seems I have ignored his warning. I made a book in grade school, writing the story, lettering the pages, binding those pages into a book with a wood-burned cover, uh, design on the front cover, bound in metal hinges. Uh, I got a speedball calligraphy set with multiple nibs and an instruction manual sometime after that. And sometime later, in graduate school, standing in the basement of the art building, I found myself learning how to set type, print letterpress, and bind books. And here I am now, 30 years after graduate school, talking to you about books, in particular, some of the many books I have made. That clever Victorian girl is Alice, who in spending time musing about many things while in Wonderland said, what is the use of a book without pictures or conversations? This most basic question suggests that a book must engage its reader, its viewer. This speaks to me about the participatory nature of the book. The reader has to pick it up and physically interact with it. And once I, as an artist, if I've engaged that re reader viewer enough to pick up the book, I better have a way of keeping them interested. The French poet that I mentioned is Stéphane Mallarme, who said, everything in the world exists to end up in a book. I believe that no idea is too trivial or no idea too large to be considered as subject matter to be explored. David Mitchell, the contemporary author of Cloud Atlas, creator of entire worlds in his writing, said this in a 2010 conversation with an interviewer. Your mind is nowhere else but in this world that started off in the mind of another human being. There are two miracles at work here. One, that someone thought of that world and those people in the first place. And the second, that there's this, there's this means of transmitting it just little ink marks on squashed wood fiber. Bloody amazing. Here he is speaking about language as a code, about a book as a container of that code that organizes information so it can be broken down, understood, and shared. Both words and images are abstractions, and both are codes to be deciphered. Words invite people into the work. Finally, these thoughts about books from El Lizitsky, the leader of the Russian constructivist art movement, writing in the 1920s. Build a book like a body, moving in space and time, like a dynamic relief in which every page is a surface carrying shapes, and every turn of a page a new crossing to a new stage of a single structure. And this is what I really enjoy, building the book and building it from all directions. Writing the text, finding a form for the text, finding a form for the book and creating imagery that works with the text. These quotes connect me to the work I make, work inspired by the physical and philosophical presence of the book, as a repository of memory and narrative, as a vehicle for transmitting transcendent information, and as a singular object, binding together a multiplicity of ideas. Here's what I look for when I'm thinking about a new project and a book and a book might have one or, or 
more or all of these elements incorporated into its, cre into its creation. Uh, so I, I might use an exquisite text, beautiful language. This is often the starting point for a book. The text leads, the imagery is created not as a matching illustration, rather as a visual response, an answer to the question posed by the text, an expansion of the thoughts of the text. It might be an opportunity to explore formats and structures, from traditional techniques to a hybrid mix of techniques, searching for the most appropriate staging for what happens in the book. For example, a number of the works here are bilingual in Hebrew and English, so there's a challenge to find a binding, a design presentation, or a format that gives equal weight to, the, to both languages and the direction in which they're written. It might be a compelling character that drives the creation of an artist's book. Um, one book that I created called By a Thread, in this case presents two compelling characters worthy of close study and research, and then an original presentation of their lives. The two women from antiquity are um, the Jewish heroine of the story of Purim, Queen Esther, and Scheherazade, the heroine storyteller of A Thousand and One Nights. They were both second wives of insomniac kings. Both rose above the harem structure they found themselves in. Both used language when they could have remained silent and saved many lives. So in that case, the writing and the imagery are mine. It might be a powerful narrative that drives the creation of an artist's book. And in this case, uh, I'll mention the solution to Brian's problem by Bonnie Jo Campbell. Um, and this text was written by Bonnie Jo, who's a Michigan uh, native and writes about um, uh, where she grew up outside of Lansing, Michigan, and the methamphetamine industry that's decimated the area. It comes from her collection of short stories, American Salvage, which was nominated for a National Book Award. This short story with seven chapters presents the tragic dilemma of Brian, a young father married to an addict. I interpreted the story to be a kind of puzzle that you, the reader viewer, must put together to read the story and to get involved in the text. So in this case, it was Bonnie's powerful narrative that pulled me in. I continually seek the complete work that contains both the beauty of gesture and a core of meaning. I often engage with classic texts and the resulting synthesis of tradition and modernity. The mark making of printmaking, calligraphy, and drawing inspire my art. I combine the finite and unique nature of hand-drawn imagery with the reproducibility of print technology. I explore the beauty and power of line and the graphic essence of a letter, whether it can be read or not. Plum Colored Regret is the book that Pe Peggy mentioned and has included in the current exhibition words like sapphire. I'd like to share a bit about this book with you now. It's based on an evocative eight-line poem written by a Jewish woman in 10th century Spain. Of all the poetry written in medieval Spain, the time when Jewish poetry and Arabic poetry were flowering and borrowing from each other, this is the only poem attributed to a woman, and she doesn't even have her own name. She is the wife of Dunash ben Labrat. So in this book, I write in her voice to fill in the elegant blanks left by the poet and to imagine her story more fully. I came upon the poem in a collection of poetry, the dream of the poem, collected and translated by Peter Cole. I was struck by the power of its eight lines. I'd like to read the poem to you now. Will her love remember his graceful doe, her only son in her arms as he parted? On her left hand, he placed a ring from his right. On his wrist, she placed her bracelet. As a keepsake, she took his mantle from him, and he, in turn, took hers from her. Would he settle now in the land of Spain if its prince gave him half his kingdom? When I shared this book with someone, she noted that the pages are misaligned and divided from one another, much in the same way that the lovers are separated in the poem, something I had not consciously considered. This observation reminded me of something I've heard the art critic Roberta Smith say more than once, artists don't own the meaning of their work. We artists have our own intentions, and then a reader or a viewer brings their ideas to the work. Before we start to look at the other books here on display, I'd like to end my formal remarks with this passage that actually begins my book by a thread. You will find it all in a book. 
what came before, what we preserve, rescue, retell, and make new. A tumble of letters and chance arrangements of images creates stories that lead to stories. There is no end to the stories. And so we turn to chapter one. Thank you. So if you'd like, what do we do now? Well, I wanted to take questions first. Sure. And afterwards, Lynn wants to have you come over to the table so she can give you a bit more conversation about the books. But if you have some questions, we could do them here before we all get up. Good question. Well, what's the uh, are any of your books printed in larger editions that are more accessible? Um, Those of us who don't collect artists' yeah. books. The by thread that I mentioned um, was done at the um, University of the Arts as, as an offset litho book. So that was um, done in an edition of 300. For me, that was huge. <laughs> but otherwise, there are 30, 10. As I get older, they get, the editions get smaller. So. <laughs> Yes. What triggered the first book that you did that you thought, what compelled you to do the very first thing? What was it, the narrative? Was it the characters? Um, and when I was in graduate school, uh, a woman came to teach photography, and she actually set up that press in the basement. And um, I was working as a printmaker, so already thinking about multiples. And, I, and it, when you make a print and you make an edition, you generally give it a title. And I found that I was agonizing over the titles as much as I was over the images. So it sort of was like, oh, you know, put it together. So that happened. They're kind of in that order. I was just going to ask about the, um, you're from Detroit? Yes. And what the, are there other printers there? Are there printmakers? Do you have sort of a book world that's in the Detroit area? Um, the honest answer is not so much. Um, but there's a, there are a couple, it's kind of weird, there's been this renaissance or Detroit kind of realized that letterpress is an interesting collaborative um, thing to do. So now there are a couple of letterpress studios that have just opened up. Uh, there's one called Signal Return where I've been teaching um, handset type and letterpress printing. But for a long time there wasn't much collaborative. Um, after I finished graduate school, I just started looking around for places where I could learn more. So I would take a class at Center for Book Arts or um, other places um, to increase my knowledge and my skill set. So for example, in an edition with 75 copies, how many of those copies do you actually work on versus delegating to others with others? Um, do you, I do all the printing. Do you physically print 75? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> but also sort of uh, very satisfying, you know, to see <laughs> the stats of things that you've created. Um, in the last, recently I've been working in collaboration with binders. I feel that that's an area of, production binding is not my area of expertise, so I've um, found really good people to work with. So I will design the binding, and then I work, in particular, I work with Linda Lemke, who's in Vermont, and um, we go back and forth. I'll send her like a mock-up, and then she'll refine it and back and forth until we, and I brought some of that to show you. I um, thought that would be interesting to have a look at. I don't think I turned this mic on. Um, anyway, um, that's part of that answer. Should I turn this mic on? I don't think I turned this guy on. Um, Can you talk a little bit more about the answer to the last question? What made you decide that binding was not your strong suit? Was it a, just a feeling you had while binding, or was it a specific instance? When I see what binders who know what they're doing do, and the exact beautiful square corners they make, and the way they'll turn the cloth to make a perfect cover, I could do that once, maybe, <laughs> but to do it 25 times. And also that, to me, is I like designing it, and the production part for me is not as creative. So if I can work with someone who really enjoys that, then that's a, that's a way to collaborate. I mean, I, all those bindings are things that I've come up with on my own, 
but um, I'm also not really set up to do, I don't have those kinds of tools in my studio as well. So partly it's practical and partly I think aesthetic that I think they can do a better job than me. So. When the American Academy, as you said, turned you loose in Jerusalem for two months, yeah. how did you spend your time? Um, I spent part of my time at the Jerusalem Print Workshop, and then I set up a studio in the apartment where I was um, and worked that way. Um, and we were there for nine weeks, and the, there were four of us. There was uh, David Herskovitz, who's a theater director in New York, and Donald Byrd, a um, choreographer, and uh, David Karnowski, an urban planner. So they said to us, oh, just go to Jerusalem and just enjoy it all and don't even think about a final project. And about four weeks into the nine weeks, they started saying, well, will you have a show? And will you, are you, are you going to do a dance? And will you be doing a theater piece? So it's good to have deadlines. But um, honestly, I was having a very hard time making things that I liked. And you know, the idea that I would have to show it was really daunting. And at a certain point, things righted themselves and there was work to show, but. Do you want to step over here and we can have a look at the books? I um, worked with a number of Israeli writers that I admire and uh, did editions with their work. Uh, this is a work with the poetry of Yehuda Amichai. This is a short story by Amos Oz, and this is um, this is the most I've ever printed and will ever print, a, no, uh, a portion of a novella, a novella length portion from the novel by um, A.B. Yehoshua, Aleph Bet Yehoshua. Um, and these are the ones where you have to figure out some kind of way to lead the, uh, the viewers in and have a, things that go in both directions. So when you open up this book, you'll see that the text moves. I can't exactly get the pages, but the two languages are in there, and it's easy for you to figure out which language you might want to read. Um, and then when you get to the back of this book, there is visual information that sort of suggests what's going on in the text. It's a, it's a, it's a dispute between Ashkenazi and Sephardi Jews, and they have to travel by boat to, uh, back to France to figure it out. So, and he sets it in the millennia before ours so that we're allowed to feel smug and say, oh, well, those aren't our problems. Uh, this is the book by Amos Oz. And also, um, if you decide to read it in English, you begin in a way that's comfortable for you. And then if you want to read it in the Hebrew, you would start from the other side. And then the, you meet the etching in the middle. It's a kind of a short, dreamlike sequence of a Russian emigre at the end of his life um, finding himself in Jerusalem. And this is the poem by um, Yehuda Amichai. And this is another way to kind of figure out uh, two languages meeting in the middle and, and somehow having you know, your eye go to the imagery in the center. Uh, this is uh, a book about the golem, who was the monster made out of mud in medieval Prague, um, created to save the Jewish people. So in this book, there are a number of ways that you can read the book. Um, there are a number of different narrative lines. So across the top, you have a spell for creating the golem because there was an incantation that had to be done just right in order for the creature of mud to appear. So just in case when you are reading this book you do it, um, the, I printed it backwards on the bottom to negate the power of you saying the... <laughs> uh, and then it is it's like the slowest flip book in the world because as you look at this facade of a building in Prague, the golem starts to emerge from the building. So books are cinematic. They, you know, the narrative moves through. This is the golem activated by Kabbalistic energy and then safely gets tucked back into the building. 
and the text is um, research that I did about this golem character and, and how old this story really is and how old this urge is to um, be able to, for man to create in a way that the, you know, that God creates according to some. Um, a book about uh, the little goat, the Chad Gad Yah, oh, and here, tells you all about it. The structure of this book is modeled after uh, a, a famous book that I love by um, El Lizitsky, that guy I mentioned. It's called For the Voice, and it's a book of poetry by um, Mayakovsky. And what um, Lizitsky did was things that we take for granted, these beautiful little tabs that lead you into the book. Um, that's what he did with the poetry, and this is what I've done with the Chad Gad Yah, because Lizitsky also did uh, a Chad Gad Yah. So it's, as some of you know, who just sang this song recently, it is allegorical, and um, I give you the historical background, um, the play of all the animals, and then um, my own allegory, which is taped off at the back. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. It's made out of um, handmade paper, especially for this edition that has goat hair in it. No goats were harmed. It was just, <laughs> it was yarn that was made with goat hair. Um, what else is here? This is, um, well, let's do this stuff first, I guess. Does anybody have any questions along the way? I don't need to be the only one. No, it was from Czechoslovakia. The paper was from the... Yeah, I learned that the hard way. Um, I, I, when I'm working with the Israeli writers, uh, I do get the rights, and, and then I heard from a translator who was really unhappy with me. But the, the writer who was alive didn't, you know, I went to the publisher, because that's where I was sent. Like, you know, just talk to my publisher. And so when the publisher gave me permission, I thought I was in the clear, and um, the translator thought not so much. So now I'm <laughs> careful. Um, but yeah, you do have to, and when I work uh, with a writer, um, I give them a portion of the edition as well, because you know, if, if it w wasn't for their art, I wouldn't be making what I'm making. This is um, a suite of prints based on the Book of Lamentations, and um, I'm gonna just lay these guys here. Um, they're woodcuts, should I just get these off? I don't know, I feel like they're in the way. <laughs> They're woodcuts that I did, so I thought the, um, the actual carving was so nice that I ended up um, using that as part of the way to lead you in. You know, they're really beautiful. So this is actually what I printed from, this piece of wood, but it was just such a beautiful thing, I wasn't quite done with it. So they became the cover. Um, and Lamentations is the laments the destruction of Jerusalem. And this is sort of, this is the colophon, and this is the essay that I wrote to put it in historical context and talking about um, exile and people driven from their homes and, and putting that in a contemporary context that kind of all turned around. And there are five chapters, so I printed them, um, in the five chapters in Hebrew and the five chapters in English. And, uh, using the wood as a material for a home since these people were exiled from their homes and using imagery of uh, doors and windows. Uh, the ovals that you see here are um, image, imagery that I've used over and over again. I started a, a series of work right after September 11th and I did these prints and used the ovals to stand for the idea that every life that was lost was an entire galaxy, an entire um, planetary system. Could you hold one up because we can't see it Oh, time. sure. Just so people can see it. Yeah, yeah. Right. Sorry, I wasn't. Why are you separating them? The, I'm just doing it because some of them were upside down and I'm gonna, I'll put it back in the right way. <laughs> 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 this is the English <laughs> and here's the Hebrew. They do, yeah. they do, they, they do, and they will. I'll put them, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness the book artist is here. Yeah. <laughs> Did you choose especially a piece of wood? Is this, I guess, 
Yeah. No, it's a, it's a birch veneer hardware store. <laughs> This is the, uh, a new piece that was done when I was in Jerusalem. Um, I mentioned that things weren't working so well in the, in the studio, in the print shop where I was working. I was making things that they, I wasn't happy with them. So I started this exercise of doing a collage a day where I was living. I had gathered up um, Hebrew language ephemera, Arabic newspaper ephemera, and started just doing this discipline of a collage a day to somehow feel like, well, at least I made this. At least, you know, I marked the time that I was there. So I um, made 67 different collages uh, while I was there and then translated them into this edition. These are um, prints, actually, from the collages. And so each month that I was there is noted here so you know where they go. But there's, um, you can see some of the, uh, 18. And all these books are in the library from this collection? All of that. This one? <laughs> yeah. They hope. <laughs> and uh, this was something that Linda and I came up with together that I think is nice. It's got this little hidden, um, this little hidden frame because October was, I spent the least amount of time there, so we had more room. So we built this little frame so that if you wanted to look at them, you didn't want to look at the whole suite, you could have that as a kind of a backup. So and what's over here? This is a part of a collaboration from, this is Minnesota Center for Book Arts, right? Years ago, they had these things called a winter book. And they asked each artist to do a page, so they would choose a writer, and then they would ask artists um, we'll across the, the center. Then. What? Back to the center. Me? Yes. No. Oh. Looking <laughs> 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 at the book. Or ask the very tall gentleman in front of you. It is not a political statement. Okay. Anyway, one of my prints is in here somewhere. Um, as part of this collaborative work. So this was an interesting project. You each got, it's kind of crazy. You got the whole story and then you had to respond to one page of the text. So there are a number of different artists. The other project, do you have a copy of Exquisite Horse in your collection? Do you know that one? Yes, I do. Yeah, I have a horse. I have the horse. We, there's a surrealist game called Exquisite Corpse where people, everybody knows that game. So this same uh, Minnesota Center for Book Arts did something called Exquisite Horse. And you either got the front of the horse or the back of the horse, and then they were put together. And it was, it was a really nice collaborative uh, collection. This is the Bonnie Jo Campbell piece that I mentioned uh, with her very powerful story. And it's set up as if it's a puzzle that you have to put together. So they're individual puzzle pieces. And then um, the story is printed on these pieces. And I really can't do it upside down, honestly. Let's see. So it's definitely an active way to experience the book. You have to put the puzzle together in order to read the story and then have this word revealed to you. Since her chapter was called Solution, Solution. To Solutions to Brian's Problem, were you creating a solution or echoing? Well, she yeah, interesting question. I do offer a solution. So when this book is put together, there's a word that might be a solution, but it's probably not enough. Because this, this problem, if you read the text, it's, he's sort of tra he is definitely trapped, not sort of trapped. He's trapped. <laughs> Not that hard, but really. <laughs> but I'm upside down and I'm in front of a lot of people. <laughs> Getting there? See it? How many are in this edition? Um, 20. 20. 20. Wow. Mm. A lot of touches. 
seems to be involved with. Is it true in some way to protect them? Is she related to Susan Campbell? And if we wanted to find out what your offering was, how would we come to read this? I mean, are you just using the, you know, what, what is my part in this? No. Oh. What is your offer of the solution when you said you came up with one oh. that's not Oh, well, do you see the word? I'm sorry. I didn't. OK. I'm yeah, you're on an angle. It this way. OK. Good. Yeah. For the TV camera. What's the word? The word is love. <laughs> <laughs> which is a hard response given the actual text, which is extraordinarily powerful and strong. Yeah. Here. So very uh, a point. few broadsides here. Mm -hmm. A broadside is single printed sheet. They were often political, but these are not. Um, this is the actual eight line poem from Bonnie Joe. Uh, from the woman in Spain, sorry, um, in Hebrew and English. And this is a, a broadside. The text here is from um, a guy, a, a Jewish man who's trying to convince Jewish people that the invention of the printing press is OK, that the idea of making things with a printing press is not going to harm um, the sacredness of the word, because people were really what are we going to do about this? You know, we have these manuscripts, and that's really the only way we should be reading. And this is um, part of his argument that um, the printing press is a wonder of the world and should be embraced. Lynn, how about uh, what you brought with you, the way you oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. will her love? Sure. Where is it? Oh, it's here. I thought it would be interesting for you to see some thinking behind how all this happens. So I brought some dummies, which is what they're called, of the books before they get to be the book. So this is the book that's in the show. Um, yeah, probably. This is Plum Colored Regret. And these are the way the pages move, these folds that don't really connect. So what you see here is in the larger type is the poem by the woman from medieval Spain. And this is my writing in the smaller text. And these different techniques include uh, lithography, where I freely lettered um, and very abstractly lettered in Hebrew, parts of the poem. And in terms of the way this book is put together, uh, there were beautiful Spanish laced bindings, and we wanted to evoke that. So this is actually punched and then threaded with um, vellum in the front and the back cover. So what I have here are some of the little models that I did to try and figure out actually was sitting in a meeting pretty bored and <laughs> started playing around with this, which is, for some of you who make books, it's, um, it's an accordion um, and then these little flag guys just glued on. But when you cut them, then they start to swing back and forth like a gate. Uh, this is how that hinge starts. So what I did is first printed it with um, this beautiful wood type that I have. So that was all printed with wood type um, and then folded up. And that becomes really the, the hinge and the structure that holds the book um, together. So you can see that maybe from the back. So that's how that works. And you can see a little bit from the inside. And so I started making these models and then increasing the scale, trying to figure out what was going to be a comfortable shape for the book and what was going to be a comfortable size. So this felt a little not right. <laughs> That's as much as I can tell you. So then it got a little bit bigger. And that was the size that I ended up with. At first, I thought it might be interesting to round those little flag, those little areas. And that seemed impossible to replicate, even for like a really good binder. I thought, no, forget it. We're not going to do that. 
we'll just keep it square. And this is a, you know, before we even get to the printing, we have to decide that this is the structure. So this is the blank model that Linda and I figured out, okay, this is the way it's going to move. This is the size. This is the lacing that will be the cover. Uh, the other thing that you have to do is figure out where your type is going to go. So this is my model that shows, you know, with little bits of um, <laughs> tape and copies to figure out how the book is going to flow and what it's going to look like. So this was one of several um, that I worked from. And then the, these are just, I guess I just brought one to show you the, some of the decisions about how the, even the front would look. So these you're welcome to, these you're allowed to touch. And this is my book that's a plum colored regret, which you're allowed to look through. And um, if you have any other questions now, having seen all these, yes. So the real obvious question, what length of time did this particular book take from the idea through the actual articulation? Of those I don't models? know. Sometimes they take, sometimes they go really fast, and sometimes they, they I don't know, maybe. But, but this particular. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I can. I never really keep track. Sometimes one will lead to another book, and that one says. Oh, I'm more interesting. Let's go there. So. Do you work on several books at the same time? Um, or do you work just on one? Uh, sometimes I work on the ideas, but if one is being addition, then usually I'm just focusing on that. Yeah. And are any of these digitized? So you know, if we can't come and look at something, is there? And there are such limited editions that. There, I have. Um, I have a nice website. Okay. It's just my name, and it has a couple of views, I think, of each book. I know. Another, you have to. <laughs> Lynn, another little plug for the exhibit words like sapphires is we had the translator of that poem, uh, Peter Cole, come and speak at the Library of Congress uh, about Hebrew poetry. And then he went into the exhibit. He stood next to the book that you've got in there, Plum Colored Regret. And we've got a webcast. He read the Hebrew and he read the English. So that's on the library's website. And uh, you can just go and type that in and you'll be able to see it. Thank you. Thanks very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.